Sorry, you can have your own two beds. One of the bits I should start with, um, which is why I'm stood here um, talking on behalf of Analogs, I'm actually going to answer much later on um, the question of why I happen to be stood up here in front of you. Um, what I'd like to talk about is a little bit about general analysing of, of gases and some of the analyzers we have, but also um, I'd like to talk about the subject of carbon monoxide and carbon monoxide poisoning and carbon monoxide analyzing. But I'll get to, to that a little bit later. Um, technical diving and even now today recreational diving and recreational rebreathers as well as technical rebreathers involve the uses of gases other than air. Uh, even when we're using air, so as a diluent in a rebreather, um, it's very wise to analyse your gas because there's no guarantee exactly what the dive centre has given you. And there is a saying in the diving community, certainly amongst the rebreather divers, which is never dive unanalyzed gas. And modern gas it contains mostly, we hope, just oxygen, nitrogen and helium. All of them are odourless and tasteless. And there is no way of human detection. And diving some gases outside of their safe limits could actually prove fatal. Um, what I'd like to do very, very quickly is just have one or a couple of volunteers to prove a point and just come and breathe from this regulator. Right, the oldest, so I'm the most expendable. Um, and he's life supported. <laughs> <laughs> so the human analyzer test. <sighs> hasn't blacked out yet. Can't taste anything. Ah, oh, yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Oh. Oh. Uh, it all. <laughs> oh, that's fun, yes. Thank you. So what do you think's in there, though? There must be here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there must be. But how much, I don't know. Quite a bit, because it's still carrying on. No idea at all. No idea of how much, no. But that's the point. If there had been no helium in that cylinder, we would just know that it's a breathable, we wouldn't even know if it's a breathable gas. So I just did that to prove a point that without analysing that, there's no way. Um, we don't even know if that's got enough oxygen because it was only a few breaths. We don't even know if that's got enough oxygen to actually support life on the surface. So we as human beings cannot detect what it is that we're breathing. So what are the safe limits? How do we determine what is in our cylinders? Oxygen safe limits have been traditionally to a maximum of 1.6 bar partial pressure. Uh, there's no real minimum as long as the gas supports life at the depth it is breathed. But obviously that means that it could be hypoxic. So I have cylinders at home with um, 496 in them. That's 4% <coughs> oxygen, 96% helium, and that is not going to keep you alive on the surface if you start breathing it not even going to keep you alive a couple of metres underwater. You actually have to get a little bit of depth before that becomes a life-supporting gas. So we need to make sure that we analyse to make sure it's life-supporting. Nitrogen is the cause of narcosis, but high partial pressures of nitrogen um, alter our levels of consciousness. Although I would hope no one wants to dive on air deeper than about 93 metres, <laughs> when you get to about 93 metres, the partial pressure of nitrogen turns the gas from basically being a narcotic gas with the associated narcosis to actually being an anaesthetic gas with the associated with properties of the potential to cause long-term problems. So, for example, back in the old days when everyone dived deep on air, you'd go to a <coughs> dive at 50 or 60 metres on air, and you'd come up and you'd say you had a great dive, we couldn't remember much about it. That's the traditional short-term memory loss that narcosis gives. But if you dive very, very deep on air, that short-term memory loss becomes permanent. There's, a, there's nothing you can do to reverse that. In the same way as years and years ago, before medicine had improved 
you could have stories in the newspapers of some poor soul going into hospital for something simple like you know, having an operation on an ingrown toenail and they never come out of being anaesthetised and remain in a coma. Similar kind of thing. The high partial pressures of nitrogen, some of the effects can be irreversible. Helium. The problem with helium is it's not life-supporting at all. One good sniff of pure HE could be your last breath ever. It displaces the oxygen and your lights go out just like that. Um, and in diving, in most diving parameters, if we've got helium in the mix, it means that we're diving deep, which could be that the oxygen is not high enough to support life. So you have to use something, one of these, one of these toys and we'll have a go later and you can play with them if you've not done already either a simple oxygen analyzer or if it's more complicated then a trimix analyzer i'm certainly going to put that on the cylinder to find out exactly what it is that's in there there are some key things that you need to do to make sure that you actually get an accurate reading <coughs> any analyzer you use has to be calibrated but for most analyzers, once you're <coughs> calibrating it once, if you keep continually calibrating it between every cylinder you analyze, the errors will just get bigger and bigger. So once it's calibrated, it's calibrated. You could then analyze 10 or 20 or 30 cylinders straight off without any need to let it reset or recalibrate, providing your cells and your batteries are in good condition. Um, also try and remember where it is in the world you are calibrating. So for example, in Florida, when we go cave diving, we can't just hold up the analyzer to the air and try and calibrate it. It will be miles out. We have to calibrate it to cylinder gas because of the atmospheric pressure and the amount of humidity in the air. Does anyone know of the top of Anyone any idea what the average oxygen content in air of the Amazon rainforest is? It can be as low as 16.9%. all that forestation should be giving off oxygen and taking in carbon dioxide but it's the absolute saturated humidity that soaks up the oxygen so if you went to, analy uh, went to calibrate your analyzer in the Amazon rainforest you need to correct it for the amount of humidity that's in the air otherwise you get a, a, an erroneous reading also with the flow rate you need to read whatever analyzer you're using you need to read the manufacturer's guideline to make sure the flow rate you're using is appropriate for the analyzer. Some analyzers don't have a flow rate, they just sit in a vat of the gas until they give you the reading. Others need a specific meters per, per minute um, flow rate. You also need to make sure that when you do analyze, you allow the, the analyzation process to take long enough to get a stable reading. And we've all used analy analyzers, we know that if we're trying to analyze a gas that's got a very high oxygen content, sometimes it takes a long time for it to eventually get to that reading. You need to give it time to get to the reading and let it stabilize. And then make sure you actually read the thing properly. So we're going to play with one of these in a little minute and see what's in that thing. Now, one of the things we don't hear a lot of when we analyse our cylinders is carbon monoxide. Why do we need to worry about carbon monoxide? Well, the diving world is getting smaller and smaller. We have the capacity now to travel to so many different exotic places to go diving. And there's no guarantee that the technology and the quality of the products that we get when we go to these remote locations has improved. Generally it has, but less than five years ago I was on a dive boat of liverboard in the Red Sea and we noticed that none of their compressors had any filtration on it at all. So I put a piece of white tissue over the front of one of the cylinder valves, opened it up and there was a big splodge of oil from the gas that we were expected to dive that morning. Luckily we had someone less barbaric on the boat who explained why it was we got going. Um, so there are more and more new diving <coughs> destinations and there is greater potential for mistakes and greater for potential for poor quality. But when I talk about some of the incidents that have, that's happened with carbon monoxide poisoning, it's not necessarily some remote location with you know, a little tin hut and, a, and an unserviced compressor that's the problem. 
So what is carbon monoxide? Again, like the other gases we talked about, it's odourless, colourless, tasteless. It has an affinity for haemoglobin 200 times that of oxygen. And it's n not an irritant. There is no irritation at all when you inhale it. So you can inhale this stuff, it doesn't hurt you, you don't know you're inhaling it. Hey, and guess what? As a human being, we love the stuff. It will actively displace oxygen from the haemoglobin and bind to the haemoglobin and will then make it so you cannot absorb any oxygen into that particular blood cell. It is the product of incomplete combustion, so any burnt organic matter in an inadequate oxygen supply. So a classic example, and it's a real example, was an overworked, overused compressor in the jungle of Mexico that basically filled cylinder after cylinder and the piston o-rings were slowly being degraded. And caused a lot of problems for a lot of people. So it competes with oxygen for the binding sites on the haemoglobin it displaces oxygen and it restricts the release of oxygen. More importantly, there is nothing you can do about it. How do we get rid of this stuff? You can't. Hyperbaric oxygen is the standard treatment for carbon monoxide poisoning, but that does not displace the carbon monoxide. All that does is make use of the available hemoglobin that hasn't got carbon monoxide to keep you, your tissues oxygenated. The normal lifespan of a carbon monoxide poisoning cell is the total life of that haemoglobin cell before it dies and is replaced by a new one by your bone marrow. It's not something that you really want to go around inhaling. So what are the signs and symptoms? At a carbon monoxide poisoning concentration of just 400 parts per million, there's pretty much no effect. 800, where the millimeter, uh, so the mercury pressure is just 14.4, you get headache, dizziness, and breathlessness on exertion. 1,600 parts per million, confusion and collapse on exertion. 3,200 parts per million, you're unconscious, a little bit more than that, profound coma, a little bit more than that, you're dead. So there's a couple of little cases here. Two cases to illustrate what can happen to divers who inadvertently breathe in carbon monoxide. So a 10 metre dive for one hour, 42 year old diver had a headache, fatigue, was uncoordinated and very confused when he surfaced. He recovered, went diving again two days later and after 10 minutes at 10 metres, he surfaced and was noticed to be acting strangely. Shortly after returning to the bottom, he swam rapidly to the surface and then slowly sank back down. His friends got him out, he was unconscious, not breathing, no pulse. CPR was initiated, he did regain consciousness and had a uh, frothy pink phlegm, confused, uncoordinated, and he required intensive <coughs> care treatment. Another case, 25 year old, dived for 10 meters. He had difficulty returning to the shore after just a half hour dive. He was seen by his buddies to be confused, needing help to remove his equipment, he was coughing, disorientated and weak with a rapid pulse from breathing contaminated air. Which country? What do you reckon? Which? Okay. Civilised enough to be close, it's Australia. And go on holiday to the Great Barrier Reef, get poisoned by carbon monoxide poisoning. Not good. This year, no, yes, this year, was it this year? No, last year. It was last year. It was just yeah, before doing um, A friend of mine was leading um, an expedition cave diving in Mexico, and they didn't even start the trip. They got the first dive, and they had their first fatality from carbon monoxide poisoning. And it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily a continuous supply of poisoned gas into a cylinder. One example I can give you is a dive centre that every whatever day of the week a delivery truck turned up, turned its engine off and made some deliveries. On one particular day they wanted to deliver something that was very heavy and so they reversed into a small alleyway next to the dive centre. The engine was left running, 
They then delivered whatever they wanted to, and the truck drove away. On that day, five cylinders were contaminated with carbon monoxide, just from the duration. So up until then, all the cylinders they were filling were fine. After that, all the cylinders they were filling were fine. Five cylinders went out with a poisonous gas in them. So it's tasteless, it's colourless, it's odourless, and it is highly poisonous. Now the reason why I'm here, actually, um, is the what is wrong with this photograph. This guy here, Clemet, was a was, past tense, a very good friend of mine. And he was cave diving in Mexico not that long ago. And he was swimming along with his buddy. No noticeable problems. And all of a sudden, there was a brief moment of him looking like he was being uncoordinated and then he was dead. And it took his buddy about an hour to swim his body out of the cave. And we spoke to the buddy afterwards and he said, I was running really short of gas. And I just looked and there's Clemé cylinders, he's hardly breathed anything really. They haven't been in the air, considering the shallow Mexico caves are very, very shallow. And we just thought, I don't know why, there's something in the back of my mind said, don't breathe his gas. And he didn't, and he survived. On that day, there were five people in intensive care and two people dead on the same day from the same filling station in Mexico. But Mexico is a very popular destination, and it's not just cave diving. When you go diving in Mexico, what normally happens is whatever dive centre you're with, they all have the same cylinders, and they all have little <coughs> colour-coded shoulders, like you know, purple and white waters, or they're all red, or they're all green, or they're half green and half red. And at night, at a certain time, every dive centre just leaves the cylinders by the side of the road, big piles of them. A big truck comes around, loads them all up from all the dive centres, disappears into the jungle, fills them all up, comes back and puts the cylinders back in the same place by the side of the road. So if you're going for an early dive, you can turn up there and just help yourself to the cylinder. Don't even need the dive centre to go. And that's what happened. All these cylinders went to um, wherever it was in the jungle, filled them all up. At least seven of them were uh, contaminated with carbon monoxide, and so five divers, all at different places in Mexico, all at different times, but all on the same day, had problems with carbon monoxide poisoning. And it's not that long ago. It's not so long ago that you think, you know, that it wouldn't happen now, because it does. Like I said, just a few weeks before Dima, where I was talking over there on the same subject, a friend of mine's cave expedition never even got off the ground because they had a death straight away the first day. So how do we remove the risk of carbon monoxide? One of these little toys, which looks exactly the same as the oxygen analyzer but with red on it and CO, it's a bit obvious. And they're very, very simple to use, to analyze. All you need is to turn it on. We're going to have a little play with it later. We've got a cylinder of what we call bump gas or test gas. Obviously, we would hope that there's no carbon monoxide in the atmosphere when you calibrate this, but you couldn't absolutely guarantee it. So the way of calibrating it is to use a known quantity or known percentage of carbon monoxide in an otherwise inert gas. Give it a little squirt, make sure it reads here what's in there. Then you know you're reading accurately and you can calibrate it and go ahead and use it. And I have one and I use it all the time. Every single space cylinder we used on the Blue Lake project was analysed for carbon monoxide as soon as it came out of the first ocean. If they weren't used, because we're diving new breeders, we didn't reanalyse them, but if they were topped up or had an air top or anything else, if it was pure O2 decanted from a big storage cylinder of oxygen, we just analysed the big storage cylinder once, but if we ran it through a booster, we'd analyse the end product cylinder. Martin, did you find any problems? None at all. None at all. I've, I've actually never found a problem. But having said that, last, last winter, diving in Bobster, and 
I came out of a dive and another instructor came running up to me and said, Martin, have you got your carbon monoxide analyzer on you? Because someone's come out of the water in obvious signs of distress. They think that there is a problem with her gas because of some of the physiological symptoms she presented. And the first thing they, oh God, she's breathing contaminated air. Martin's here, he's got carbon monoxide analyzer in his car, let's go and find out. And last week, same dive centre actually said to me, <laughs> we thought we had another one when someone got to about six or ten metres or whatever and started to go all over the place. Now, that was a bit more obvious, it wasn't carbon monoxide, that was the old no scrubber in the wheeler trick. But <laughs> <laughs> get to know the time. <coughs> so, we spend a few minutes normally if we're diving with nitrox or diving with um, trimix, we spend a few seconds or a few minutes analysing our gas to make sure that it's life supporting. Why don't we spend the same amount of time analysing our gas to make sure it's not life threatening? Very few people do, but the instances of carbon monoxide poisoning are not as rare as you would imagine. Um, anyone, anyone got any questions? What's the percent, you, you, you put some figures up there, parts per million, of um, the effect. So somebody, yeah. that one, and then the one, the, the following slide, where you were giving the two examples of guys in Australia. What sort of parts per million do you know were in their gas? Or I don't know what was in their gas. I can tell you what was recommended. What is it? Five parts per million for this? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> five yeah. parts. So if you analysed your gas and it had five parts per million carbon monoxide in it or more, you can't go diving with that. Yeah. It's the same as any gas. We know that on the surface, just a few parts per million of any gas or a few percentage of any particular gas may not have an adverse effect on us whatsoever yeah. on dry land. We take it underwater and the increase in the particle pressure is going to really, really um, affect us. So I don't know how many parts per million they had. Not much, otherwise we'd be dead after half an hour. Yeah. Okay. And I don't know how much was in the, um, in the cylinder of the chap who died just a little while ago in Mexico. Um, a lot of people said, oh, it's not carbon monoxide poisoning, it's this or it's that, or you didn't show the right signs and symptoms. But I spoke to the team leader at Diva, and he said, we did get someone down to analyse this cylinder, and it was contaminated. He didn't tell me how much, I don't know, but it was contaminated. It was a contaminated enough to kill it. But he wasn't very deep. He died in New Mexico, just 10 metres deep. <coughs> And you said he wasn't down very long before this came out. No. So, wasn't there a bit of closure? Hmm. So, does anyone want to come in and analyse a cylinder? Claudia, please. Uh, who's, are they yours? Do you want to analyse those? Yes. <coughs> One's the nitrox off the bank, and the other one's there off the bank. <laughs> and you're curious to know what's in them? Oh, yes. I know what the. Well. My analog trimix analyzer gave me that as 40 or 40.1%. You want that up as well? No, you shouldn't need that. Let's put a new surf in there. So, what you're doing with that is just giving it a bump of gas. It should be alright. It goes straight into there. Just make it a smidge. Nine and ten, which means which is what is in there. <coughs> so now we want these 
if they're yours, yes, to say nothing. <laughs> Thankfully, we're not in the commercial diving world where, in saturation diving, the gases they breathe are about as pure as you can get. But in non saturation, what you know, like wet bells with big hats on, they have an alarming number of carbon monoxide incidents every year. Where does it come from? Faulty compressors, I'm sure. Faulty compressors or that odd lorry reversing into you know, an alleyway just at the wrong moment. Mm. A car left running outside the dive centre that no one knows about. That kind of thing. Normally it's faulty compressors. Which but they have to be um they're not electric driven compressors, they are Well no, the the products <coughs> what do you know? The products of incomplete combustion can happen on any moving component if you've got the suit, if you've got organic material in there. It doesn't have to be. You know, an electric compressor still has pistons in it. Right, okay. So yeah. Alright. 
Yeah, it does burn the oil when it's using it. If the oil's getting past the piston ring and it's moving around, you've got basically a diesel engine. Well, I know what's supposed to be in this cylinder. Any ideas how much helium? He said a lot. Uh, I would have thought it was over 30% from the way my voice Okay. Goes. Because I know how silly I sound when I'm doing a bubble check <coughs> when I've been diving with 20-30. Argon has the opposite effect. It doesn't shorten your vocal cords, it lengthens them. So a small dry suit inflation cylinder with enough oxygen to be life supporting, a bit of squirt of argon in your back pocket next time you're in the nightclub, mm -hmm. and you just um, instantly turn into Barry White.
and that's that's how I came to be stood up in front of you know, as an analog teacher. So, I don't work for analogs, they don't pay me to work for them, I'm just more than happy to try and you know, get the message out that the number of people who don't analyze their gas, even in night shops, you know, where you know, it's pick it up in the shop says, yeah, it's 32%. They're not so low and they trust them. Yeah. I was uh, at Stony Cone and <coughs> one of my friends said to me, another instructor, he said, would you go and sign for my students' gas? because I haven't got my card and you know, they know who I am and I'm here teaching and we the course but without a piece of plastic they won't let me sign for my students' gas. Yes, I'll go up and sign for your students' gas. So we're walking back and his, this other um, instructor student started to say, God, I, know, I don't want to dive here too much, you know, that's really expensive gas. How much did you pay? So it was like you know, 16 or 17 pounds for 3 litres of oxygen or 3 litres of air. And I said, did you analyse the air? And said, well, no, why would I? So let's go back and analyse it. Because I'd already guessed that he'd been charged for two cylinders of oxygen. So he <laughs> analysed one. One was 100% and his air diluent was 84%. Which would have been interesting. Yes. Got a better story than that. I was diving in Menorca. And two courses running, really? open circuit trimix, closed circuit trimix. And obviously at the end of the day, all the open circuit cylinders have to be refilled. We want this in the back gas, we want this, we want this. And we said, all of the open circuit 7 litre cylinders need to have 80% in them for tomorrow. Not a problem. And all of the rebreather stuff was just kept into one corner. We don't want that to happen. Sat on the end of the rebreather and assembled bailout cylinder stack was a 7 litre bailout cylinder with a regulator in, pressurised, with a label on it that said air. The dive centre, obviously unbeknownst to us, took the cylinder, took the regulator off, blew out all the air, filled it with 80%, left the air sticker back on, put the regulator back in, pressurised it again and put it back where it was. During the dive, the student descended a little bit too quickly and it meant that the partial pressure of oxygen in his rebreather went up a little bit, a little bit too quickly. We call it a PO2 spike. He didn't need to come off his rebreather. All he needed to do was to do what we call a dilute flush. And yep. in that particular circumstance, there is no, you know, he is the cause of the problem by going down too quick. A dilute flush would have solved it. But he bailed off, so now at 40 metres he's breathing 80% which does cut down your decode. He, he then is okay, he goes back onto his rebreather and exhales 70 something percent into the rebreather. The rebreather goes mad. You know, you know massive high PO2, he comes off again, oh, what am I doing, what am I doing? Breathes 40 percent, goes back on his rebreather, tries to take control of the rebreather, it fails again. Third time, bails off, convulses, not happy. Um, we did lift him to the surface, he was okay, he wanted to go diving again that afternoon, which we thought was not necessarily the most sensible thing, but the point I'm trying to make is, unless you are in charge of your cylinders all the time, you should analyse them. On the Blue Lake project, every morning, my personal stash of, I don't know, something like 18 bailout cylinders. Every morning, all the regulators were taken off, just unscrewed, and every single one was reanalyzed. Because I haven't been in the dive center overnight, lots of other people have. They've been mixing other divers, support divers, gas, other rebreather cylinders, other bailouts and I don't want them to stay. So every morning, every cylinder is analysed. Now if they're in the boot of my car or in my house or I'm in charge of them, that's different. Yeah. Now, but if you've just left your twin set there and you've analysed it and it says 
and you say to the dive centre, can I leave it here overnight, and leave it in their filling station to pick it up the next day to go diving, you'd be very foolish just to put it on your back without analysing it again. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to Martin for coming today and doing this. Obviously, um, as Analox, we manufacture and make the, the analyzers, but really to, to stress is the importance of, of analyzing the gas. You know, if anybody else is analyzer, if that's all you've got available, fine, but the importance is, is analyzing the gas. Um, if you've got any questions about anything that, that we produce or any of our products, then you know, come and see us or um, today, or I'll give you my card and, and give us a call. But um, you know, thank you very much for coming, and, uh, and I hope that you know you've, you've got a lot out today. We certainly have, um, and you know we've really enjoyed having Martin to come and speak for us, and we're very privileged that he can come and do this for us as well. So thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure.